So Donald, um, we'll have you uh, say your name, um, where you're speaking, where you're located, and how you came to system changes. Right, right. Go. Well, it's been a long and rambling trip, uh, as indicated on the bar there. My name is uh, Donald Officer. Um, I grew up in Ottawa and met a lot of interesting people there, and a lot of people who were not so interesting. But um, uh, but then I spent a few years in Toronto, which is where I, I, I met um, Peter Jones, who told me about this group. And I had always been interested in systems because it struck me as the, the only way to look at things. Um, I think I may have some sort of learning disabilities, but I, I find it very hard to grasp something unless I grasp the whole of it and see how it interacts with the other elements that contribute to whatever it is. And then I have enough confidence to go on, which didn't work out too well in the Ontario school system, but um, <laughs> I put in enough extra work to get through. And, uh, um, but then I got interested in it again when I was uh, working in the federal government. I uh, found Wes Churchman's book on systems. I thought, this is really, really good stuff. And I was also very concerned, too, about, um, well, I was actually trained by the government to, uh, uh, they called me a work-study officer. So that seemed redundant in my case. But nevertheless, uh, that's what I did. I had to go out there and measure things and then uh, work with statistics, which was the less pleasant part for me, but uh, and figure out better ways of doing things and also ways of making different um, operations, if you like, in the, in the division of labor function together more effectively. Came out of operations research in you know, World War II, which I guess systems study did really too, for a lot of it. But anyway, uh, I, I, I began to realize like most of my classmates you know, when I was doing this, that. Uh, it may be a very effective in terms of the mechanics of getting the job done, but didn't necessarily engage or interest people or, or, or make them um, connect in ways that were as productive and as uh, healthy as they could be. Okay. So, uh, you know, anyway, long story short, I got very interested <laughs> in psychology. Very it's too Are late, you, eh? Yeah, it's I already know. too long. I thought it was quite good. I think I just want to give it's it been a long time chance. since I talked to anybody. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, okay. anyway so maybe I, we could I was very just... interested in, in the subject, and I, and I keep dropping in on it every so often and keep discovering things that to, to tell me more and more about it. And it's become a very useful tool for me to organize my own thoughts. Okay, thank you, uh, Donald. Okay, Stephen, please. Um, well, um, the, the, tonight's uh, tonight's persona is a different kind of a persona. Uh, tonight, uh, I would like to situate myself uh, in the uh, liberal arts education context. And okay. uh, my background is uh, in the history and philosophy of science and technology. And there was a history and philosophy of science and technology group at the University of Toronto and also at Harvard University. And I had the pleasure and privilege of being associated with both of those, uh, both of those groups. Um, but the real connection is Trent University um, where uh, this liberal arts education mindset was carried out um, uh, and implemented. Uh, so we had uh, we had courses, we had a whole stream in digital culture, for example, and digital culture stream started in 1990, 1992, just about the time when the World Wide Web became one of the global implementation of hypertext and hypertext and the hypermedia item. And we had courses in uh, systems, uh, so we had a full stream of courses uh, offering a degree in systems um, and also in design. Okay, and, Stephen, so could we, I know that you probably have more, but would you mind if I just kind of moved on a little bit? I'm getting the, the old, you know, 
Um, what sure. she called it. Yeah. We, 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 we traditionally start off system thinking Ontario with 15 second introductions. <laughs> the question we usually ask is, how did you come to systems? And uh, usually there's a topical question, uh, something like, um, do you, have you ever heard of uh, Stephen Pepper or World Hypotheses before? Yes. Uh, so let me just then conclude. Uh, I came to systems through the history and philosophy of science and technology. Um, and eventually I found Kenneth Boulding. Kenneth Boulding's The Image is the book. So that's my contribution for tonight. Thank you. And Mr. Hawk, are you on the call? I am here. Oh, great. Uh, do you want to say a few words? 15, <clears throat> Sorry. Minutes, 15 seconds or not? Sorry, I'm late. I was trying to get someone to hang up on me. Uh -huh. I couldn't make them angry enough. It took okay. a long time. So, okay. Very, very sorry, group. Okay. Um, a few words. Yes, nice to be here. That's nice to be here. Yes. Okay. That's Thanks a, a lot, David. Um, uh, relative to the pepper thing, okay. as I told David, I uh, first encountered that book back in the 70s uh, in an Eric Trist course. That was one of the textbooks that he had recommended for that book. And so he was very much into the contents. And uh, and if I remember right, we did like it. Uh, I think I had trouble because I used four. And so I have this funny mania that anyone who uses four, I get all squeamish about, including David, my friend. And so uh, four was my problem, but the rest of the book was great. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, Lowell Christie, are you there? Yes, uh, Lowell Christie. <clears throat> co-founder of the Forum on Democracy. Uh, my exposure was with uh, Douglas Engelbart, the inventor of the mouse hypertext windows. Most of his ideas have never been implemented because they deal with social systems, not just mechanical systems. And my thesis advisor is Gregory Bateson. And so I come to systems from a cybernetic perspective. Thank you. Elena, are you there? here uh Elena Hi. in Toronto um I also come from the cybernetics perspective um <clears throat> working uh with AS American Society for Cybernetics International Society for System Science and um working very closely with Stafford Beer on viable system model and team's integrity process uh this is my first exposure to Pepper I was only familiar with Tris through the socio-technical side of things. And I'm very glad to be here and become introduced to Pepper. Thank you. Camilio Riva, I think is the right way to say that, I hope. Are you there? You want to say a few words to us? Um, she's on mute, or he's on mute, so I can't tell. Oh. Yes? No. No, there's a chance some of them are international um, okay. callers and some of them are in different times time zones, so they might not. They, they uh, might have just, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Metcalf, you're up there next. Thanks, Dan. I'm Gary Metcalf. I formerly came to systems in the mid-1990s uh, through my PhD work and spent a lot of involvement with the International Society for the System Sciences and with the International Federation for Systems Research and continue on with pretty much independent uh, research and writing now. Thank you. Uh, Genesis, I think, wrote something. So you can look in the chat for that, unless uh, Genesis wants to also speak. All right, so that's good. And Griffin, I think, is next. Hey, everybody. Griffin calling in from Guelph, Ontario. Uh, part of this group for a couple of years now, a while. Um, and I come to it. I think through Peter Jones as well and the OCAD crew. Uh, I'm also the country leader of Creative Commons Canada. So I do a lot of work on copyright and that kind of thing. And a, I'm a uh, doctoral student at the University of Waterloo uh, at Wiser, which is an institute for social innovation and resilience. So I do a lot of work on like complexity uh, systems, that kind of stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, nice. thanks very much. Okay, Joanne, I think you were here actually one of the early ones. So go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hosting this event. Um, I come to you as a humble student of systems. I came here through Peter Jones and Jeremy Bose. 
and um, I'm still a student uh, studying at OCAD, the Strategic Foresight and Insight uh, Innovation Program. Thank you. So Pepper is new to me. <laughs> I'm here to learn. Thank you. Kelly. Hi. I'm, Ke I'm Kelly. I'm, I'm uh, currently in Toronto. I come from a background of design intelligence. Uh, I came through Peter Jones from design thinking into systems. And uh, I, I'm part of David Ng's uh, Systems Changes Learning Group. And I'm speed reading through Pepper. Trying to catch up. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Eva. Um, hi, I graduated from OCAD as well. Um, I just saw some promotion email from David, so I joined today. Great. Okay, uh, Nishat. Not saying anything? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, so uh, I'm in Toronto myself. Um, my, well, my first introduction to systems thinking was through David Hawk here, um, maybe when I was 19 years old, I was a student of his in, in his business classes, and he introduced me to people like uh, Churchman, West Churchman, and, um, you know, Russell Acoff, etc. So nice. that's how I got into the field. Very nice. Thank you, Nishad. Uh, Peter Scott. Yes, uh, uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, Peter Scott here, and uh, I'm based at in Toronto as well, out of OCAD, and um, uh, I haven't uh, been part of this group for a while, but I just haven't been around, and, and so I just, uh, just wanted to reconnect, and uh, it's nice to see some familiar face, David and Elena and Kelly, um, and um, yeah, I, I came through system thinking through Peter Jones as well, and um, design dialogue. Thank you. Uh, Robert Best is um, sort of, I guess he probably has a baby or something, so he left a little thing in the chat so you can read that, unless Robert wants to say something now. Okay. Uh, there's a Saye Behesti, I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Saye. Um, I'm a student at uh, York University. And uh, I got into systems thinking a few years. I've been a member of this group for a while uh, through Martin Bunch's class Great. and new to Pepper. So let's see. Let's see. Uh, Zach. Hello, <clears throat> I'm uh, joining from Toronto uh, and I uh, have no exposure to Pepper. So I'm looking forward to at learning about this person's work today and I'm uh, in uh, mechanical engineering uh, field and that's how I, I arrived at uh, Stafford Pierce uh, viable system model was my introduction to this sort of area. So great. Okay. Um, I, th I think that, did anyone I missed something I saw somebody pop up on the screen but I wasn't sure because it was there's a couple of there's Ward, Ward Cunningham and oh, that's it. Ward Cunningham, yes, and, but and Valerie Lamont. So there's three, yeah. Uh, they're not there on my list now, so, but Ward Cunningham, if you want to say something, oh, there you are. Ward Cunningham, would you like to, uh, give yeah, us a few I'm, words? I'm, uh, uh, most of what I know about systems I've learned from computer programming, uh, heavily influenced by uh, Alan Kay and Chris Alexander, uh, trying to get that, uh, feeling into programming. Uh, I built a system called Wiki to try to do that with the early web and it's been successful. So uh, I know David uh, through his uh, interaction with the, uh, the newest version of Wiki I've built. Uh, Valerie Lamont, did you wanna say a few words? Sure. I'm Valerie Lamont. I'm joining you from Maine. I'm co-founder of the forum. And I come to systems via cybernetics with Heinzman Forrester, the Biological Computer Lab, and the Plato Laboratories at the University of Illinois. Uh, today, I'm pulling together with other team people, cybernetics, systems, and design 
uh, in terms of uh, looking at our system of government. Thank you. And finally, I'm Dan Ng. I've been called upon to help moderate some stuff. Um, and I came to systems uh, from David Ng's System Changes Learning Circle. Looking forward to Pepper, though. Looks up, like it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. I guess David's your turn now. Take it away. Thanks, Dan. Um, so the the format here is um, uh, or the, uh, the format here is going to be a little unusual in that uh, we have three people in in this. So I'm going to try to run over the content. Uh, Zad is going to try to slow me down and ask all the questions that people are are trying to keep up with. And Dan is going to be watching the chat. Uh, if people would pop in questions as we go along, um, I've, I've fallen into this um, uh, into this work. Uh, it's been about a month reading this book, which is unusual for me. Uh, I'm going to do a, a screen share and actually go and um, uh, work mostly in the um, Federated Wiki. But what I'm going to do is, let's see if I can get out of here. Okay, that's not working. Let me get David, while here. you're setting up, I'll just touch on, I'll just introduce myself for, okay. for context of, speaking of context, yeah, my name is Zad Khan. Um, I came to systems through the OCAD University program through uh, Dr. Peter Jones. And so I have some exposure to some of the core system concepts, um, but I also came uh, to uh, join David Ng, Dan Ng, Kelly uh, in systems changes learning, where we're exploring um, some of the more uh, historical aspects of it. And so I'm interested in questioning uh, some of the work that David is covering uh, via Pepper. So I'll be I'll be playing that role tonight. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Zad. It's sort of I figured you were already introduced. No problem. <laughs> okay, let me try the screen share again. Okay. So um, I start off with this screen, and this is uh, two of the diagrams that I had drawn in trying to figure out um, Pepper and. Um, I've done most of the work actually in Federated Wiki. And so there is, and the link was provided at the beginning, um, there is a, um, a wiki. Let's see if I find the one. This would be WH. Uh, and I've created a, a, a wiki on world hypotheses. Now, uh, since we have Ward, who is actually the person that actually um, is responsible for this technology, and um, Robert, who is in supporting us in the Open Learning Commons, uh, the reason that I actually decided to use um, Federated Wiki for this project was that it's really complicated. Uh, the, the content is so complicated, there's so many interlinkages that uh, any linear presentation, I normally would do a slideshow, any linear presentation is really um, uh, not good. It, it, just, it just won't work. Um, Dan, I think when you put you on a highlight, are you guys, do you, are you watching the screen or are you watching me? Do, do people see the screen or do they see my face? Screen, 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 but you're on the side. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Reduce, the, the little David. The little <laughs> okay, David. thanks. <laughs> um, so <laughs> let, let me back up a little bit, which is a, there's a little context to this, uh, which is a blog post that I wrote in 2020. Um, and one of David Hawke's favorite articles is the causal texture of organizational environments and this 1976 Emory and Trist article. And so this actually used to be a, a pretty standard work that you would do in an MBA course in organizational uh, design, organizational development. Um, but this idea of causal texture, it's like, what is causal texture? Like, and what did it actually mean? So I ended up writing this one blog post and I went back through the history of what causal texture was. And I ended up um, in the description of causal texture and going back. And then I ended up having to do a map, um, this one CMAP tools because I couldn't figure out what was going on in that article. Um, and it came to this idea of contextualism and contexture. And this goes back into um, what uh, into what does contexture mean? Um, and coincidentally, I'd been, uh, my colleague, uh, Susan Nosla had a paper rejected um, from, from some German reviewers. And they said, well, you don't under, you're not writing about context. And there's a discussion about what does context mean? Context is not text. It is like texture. And so um, that was an interesting departure. And it's like, okay, so I kind of got that, but this took me back into Pepper's article 
which was in uh, 1934. Um, and so it's like, okay, um, Emery and Trist, whoops, someone needs to mute, please. Um, in, in, 19, uh, uh, in 1965, the causal texture of organizational environments paper gets written. And when I was looking back through it, um, there was a reference to Pepper and Pepper is back in 1934. And what I read is that uh, Emory and Trist are trying to do some research in between 1969 to 65, and end up going back and reading the original works of, of Pepper. Um, and it's like, okay, so I kind of got that. And I got the ideas about psychology and a lot of things that happen with contexture. And I'll go over some of that. Um, but that, that's the background that I had done in 2020. And so then uh, when I started looking at the book, uh, the 1942 book, uh, it's like, oh, this is going to take a lot. Um, and so I'm going to step through the pages here with you and, and try to keep it going. Um, but the other thing that happened when I posted the announcement for this talk was that I end up getting a, uh, a response uh, from the systems community. And so in LinkedIn, I got a response from Michael C. Jackson. Uh, Mike Jackson uh, is uh, um, Order of British Empire, um, uh, but he was the dean of the school uh, at the Hull University Business School, and he was a person that's been doing a lot of critical systems thinking work. And so he responded and said, oh, he likes it. And then it got into digging into some more of the history, uh, which required me, and as I was responding, it's like, okay, so I'm going to have to write this blog post to respond. And so this goes on and on and on and on. Um, and for those of you who, um, who are still hanging on to this after the end of this, um, Gary Metcalf sent me an email as well, and he may be picking up on some of these themes for February. So if we're going too fast for you now, um, Gary may have another spin for you in another month. Um, anyway, so let me go here and um, let me step through, and I'm gonna be clicking various links that open up in Federated Wiki so that uh, people can kind of get a track of, of what we're talking about. So Stephen C. Pepper, now, okay, 1891 to 1972, uh, he was at UC Berkeley and he was there from 1919 to 1953. Um, his focus was, um, he was a professor of aesthetics. And it's interesting to think about him working because the, the World Hypothesis book is not really about aesthetics. Um, and so it's like, okay, what's this guy doing? Um, but there's a, uh, there's a pragmatist tradition that comes through. Um, and so if you're into, into the philosophy of science and coming down through various branches of philosophy, um, the American pragmatism is, is kind of the lineage come down through William James and people like that. Um, anyway, so um, UC Berkeley uh, was founded in 1876 and Pepper actually established the arts program they had at Berkeley. So we're talking about, um, you see Berkeley being a relatively young institution at this point. And so he's credited with starting the art department, um, more historical perspective on uh, his history, if people wanna read that. Um, anyway, so um, the book, the study is published 1942. Um, there, if you uh, want to find, the, there's an e-version available now, uh, internet archive has, you can sign it out. Um, there is a preface um and it talks about why he's writing the book and and it's it's philosophical this is this is definitely in the philosophy section uh, i'm just going to go over quickly um the outline here which is um uh it goes through uh various uh, let, let me back up i'm going to come back to this um because the question that, that came up is like why should i care and what is this all about and netting it out the idea that is important out of world hypotheses is that, uh, and this is not what Pepper said, this was what people have said by Pepper afterwards, is that he's created a theory of knowledge based on doubt. And that statement by itself is interesting because if you stop and think about theories of knowledge, do people actually assume that, is no, that there is knowledge and that you kind of add to it, you can work with it? Um, the pragmatist approach, which is, uh, brings up the term common sense, uh, actually usually brings up the idea of doubt, uh, because if you have common sense, you look at the world and you kind of go, well, that makes sense or that doesn't make sense. So it's not philosophically um, uh, 
philosophically founded in that way where it's like mathematical or something like that. So the, the idea of working from common sense, uh, he works through the idea of skepticism. He goes back to uh, Charles Sanders Peirce uh, and, there's, and now he gets into the encyclopedias, but he comes down through this tradition. So people that uh, would normally come to uh, Pepper uh, would actually see themselves as part of the uh, pragmatist tradition. And um, the pra pragmatist tradition also comes down through C. West Churchman and also through Russ Acoff. So the American uh, approach to system thinking. Do you want to do uh, a brief one sentence explanation of what is pragmatism? Not really. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I need I need I need a full lot like. So for, for those of you who actually, actually, there are people who actually done philosophy as a degree. I have not done philosophy as a degree, and I actually don't like doing philosophy, except at certain points you get to this is kind of like, okay, where is this person coming from? And um, we work in the system sciences, but when you can't get the answers in science, then you end up having to back up into philosophy. Um, so for, for now, um, Zad, let me just respond and say that, um, I would, uh, my, my short answer is pragmatism works on the idea of common sense. Um, and, and then you ask, well, what does common sense mean? It's like, oh, now you need a whole course in philosophy. So then one, one more minor question is, what's the relationship between common sense and doubt building off of his title there? Um, so the, the, the doubt would actually, uh, you, so when you talk about common sense, so it's not just an individual, it is a group of people that would then try to make sense in the same way. And so there's a common sense. Um, but then you run into the issue of, well, what if everyone doesn't believe the same thing? And so there's always a sense of doubt associated with it. And um, uh, I'm going to go backwards through the book um, because he actually does, he, what he does is a philosophical thing. He starts at the bottom, builds its way up. But the, um, he comes up with what he calls four root metaphors, and that'll make it a little bit clearer. So, so hang on a little bit. Okay. Gotcha. But, so I'm just going to go down through this page. So those of you are probably glad that Zad stopped me at this point. Uh, okay. So um, Franklin Berry wrote the introduction. Um, and the introduction is over here. If you click through, it's actually not on the wiki. Uh, let me get back to that wiki page. Uh, hold on. Find my mouse. Where's my mouse? Oh, it's over here. Okay. Um, so what's the value of world hypotheses? World hypotheses is three, three contributions. One, a theory of knowledge based on the progressive refinement of adult common sense knowledge. Okay, so that's where it comes in. Secondly, the root metaphor theory. And so um, the th what happens is that the world hypothesis, um, the, wor the, the, the word world hypothesis is interesting because it is a precursor to a world theory. For those of you who like the layman's description, you guys have heard of a theory of everything. A theory of everything would be a world theory. And so it's kind of like, can you build a theory of everything? Like, uh, uh, can you build a, a, a theory, a world theory? Um, and if we start from the idea of doubt, it's, well, you could build a hypothesis that it is a world theory, but then you have the challenge of saying, okay, how do I prove that this is actually a theory if we're using scientific method? You, you set up the hypothesis and then it's either prove or disprove, you, you gather corroborating evidence. Um, but the root metaphor theory boils down from that because inside our heads, we all have these world hypotheses and that this is the way we think the world works. Everyone thinks differently. Um, but then we kind of boil it down and say, well, you know, is it something like a machine? Um, does it look like something else, like a form? And we'll go through some of those. So then he has the analytical examination of the six world hypotheses um, and the six world hypotheses of which four are considered adequate. So uh, I'm gonna go over the four, then I'll do the two that weren't adequate and then I'll do some more um, after that on, um, uh, let's see here. Okay, so the value is classifying relatively metaphorical metaphysical positions. I hate metaphysics. Um, there's a book written and describes it, a classic contribution to metaphilosophy. Okay, what the heck is metaphilosophy? Metaphilosophy is a study of nature of philosophy. <laughs> so it's a philosophy of philosophy. It asks, what is philosophy? What is it for? And you know, how does one do philosophy? So this is like philosophy for philosophers. Um, and, and 
it's it's off the deep end. Um, okay, so he, he comes up with the idea of root metaphors, and I'll come back to this again. Uh, root metaphor may work may grow into a world theory, and I have a world theory uh, where you actually get evidence towards um, on a hypothesis towards the theory. There is a root metaphor theory, uh, which is a theory of metaphysics. Um, and so there's various sources you can read on that. Um, but if you have a hypothesis, um, and he describes hypothesis, um, for those of you who've had high school, we'll use a high school idea when you go and take science class, you have a hypothesis, and then you prove it or you disprove it. Um, but it's supported by evidence and corroboration. Now, this is when I started getting and drawing all these funny diagrams, um, which I'm not going to do initially. Um, but it, the, you get into, well, okay, so you have this idea of doubt. You have a root metaphor. You've got a world hypothesis. And it's like, well, how do you prove that? And he comes up with um, four relatively adequate hypotheses, two inadequate hypotheses, which he used as strawman, and then some additional proposed ones um, that come down. Um, before I go into the root hypothesis, um, in 2020, Michael Jackson had written, uh, he, so he's been publishing a series on multi-methodologies for critical systems practice. And in, in the first one, uh, in the first chapter that he wrote, the first article, it's explore the problem situation. And when he does that, he talks and actually summarizes um, uh, Pepper's work. Um, and he goes through and describes the, uh, the four uh, adequate hypotheses. Um, and then he also mentioned Lakoff and Johnson for those uh, metaphors we live by. Um, and metaphors we live by is not actually a philosophical work in the same, uh, at the same depth. Um, the, he also mentioned, Mike Jackson also talks about Burrell and Morgan, Sociological Paradigms Organization Analysis. And this is a standard a classic textbook, again, in organization theory that uh, generally doctoral students do. They usually don't do it at the master's level. At the master's level, people might have uh, read uh, or heard about Images of Organization by Gareth Morgan, which is a way of making um, the Burrell and Morgan book friendlier. And we actually had a System Thinking Ontario session about that quite a few years ago. Um, but the, the question now is, well, you know, are we just looking at metaphors or are, is this actually something that's more solid, more common sense understanding of the world so that you could actually say, no, the, the, this is more than a metaphor. This is how we actually describe the world. Um, okay, so uh, Mike Jackson had written about this. Um, the, uh, another interesting one was um, in 1972, uh, so remember this book is published in 1942. Uh, and in 1972, we have this young guy, um, uh, Irvin Laszlo. Irvin Laszlo is still alive. And he wrote this book, Introduction to Systems Philosophy. And he said, ah, this might be another world hypothesis. It's like, okay, that's interesting. So um, no one has actually followed through on this, but to have, um, have Pepper actually review in a philosophy journal and say, oh, that this could be a world hypothesis. He doesn't say that it's an adequate world hypothesis, though. So he doesn't say that it's a good hypothesis or a bad hypothesis. It's a world hypothesis, and it's actually based around the idea of self-organization, dynamic self-regulating system, which is the root metaphor. Um, David, can I can I can yes. I suggest maybe a pacing thing? You have you have us teased up enough for these hypotheses. Does it make sense to maybe jump in? So just to recap, yes. like. He's coming from a pragmatism background. There's a the idea of uh, knowledge, building knowledge based on doubt that comes out in some of the languages about these world hypotheses. And since that publication, there's many contemporary and historical authors that are using that work um, yes. towards these systems theories. And so, yeah, okay. it's, it, I think we're all excited now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to, uh, let's see, let's go back to root metaphors. Which was, here we are, root metaphors. Okay. So let's go to the four relatively adequate hypotheses. Okay, so um, so the way he does it is a scope and precision, but I'm gonna bring this out. There are four hypotheses, and this is actually going to be in a table um, so I can actually describe these. Okay, so this is summarizing um, 
a 19, a 1988, Stephen Hayes. Stephen Hayes is actually uh, a psychologist and he's been using the, uh, the, the um, root metaphor uh, and world hypothesis approach in behavioral analysis. But there are four world hypotheses and um, the way that uh, the table's laid out is, here's the world hypothesis, the root metaphor that, it, that is underneath it, the categories. And so um, Pepper requires that, you, that there are categories associated with it so you kind of understand what's happening with the world. Um, and then theories of truth. How is it that you would actually determine whether this is true or not true? So the first world hypothesis he has is called formism. The root metaphor is similarity, which is a recurrence of recognizable forms. And so uh, when you say, uh, you know, blades of grass, well, that usually presumes that one blade of grass is like another blade of glass. We talked about sheets of paper. Okay, so each sheet like one sheet is like another sheet, um, but then you could have, well, you know, yeah, uh, is a yellow sheet of paper the same as a red sheet of paper, the same as a white sheet of paper? And you go through those sorts of things where you go, okay, the this this is basically form. Rows of donuts, and it talks about each donut being independent, but from there, it's kind of like you can compare these all. So the categories they have are, um, character. So how would you decide that something is like something else? There's a quality. So a donut is soft and warm and sticky and there are relations. So the donuts are side by side together. Um, particularity, this donut is unique. Participation, a donut is one of many donuts. Um, and a, a class, uh, gorilla refers to characters, events, and participations. I can't remember that exactly. Um, they're trying to explain, explain uh, how you um, how you group things together. Um, the criterion is correspondence. And so what is true for one is true for the other. And so if we look at, go back to the example of sheets of paper, uh, if you tear one sheet of paper, all pieces of paper should tear about the same. And so the evidence is a cognition of similarity between description and referent. So there is an ideal sheet of paper as an example, um, because if you actually have, uh, if you're producing sheets of paper, they're not all eight and a half by 11. They're all, you know, they go through a machine, so there's a little bit of variance, but the ideal, there's an ideal eight and a half by 11. There's an ideal white, um, and that's how you would work through the theory of truth. So that's formism. So if you see the world as form, um, then you can think about, okay, this is like that, uh, and therefore, um, th you know, th that's how the world is. Um, I've been thinking about uh, about COVID as an example recently and the pandemic. And one of the things that came out of that was, oh, this is like uh, SARS. That's a formism type of approach, which is, okay, uh, how do we handle this uh, this new pandemic with COVID? Well, we have all the experience with SARS. It looks like a, a epidemic. So we're going to do some of the stuff that we did with SARS. Right? The second world hypothesis is mechanism. Uh, the root metaphor is a machine, uh, discrete parts related to other systematic way. You put force or energy, and there's two ways of looking at it. One is a discrete mechanism, so a lever on a fulcrum, and so that's a static view. Um, you start off with a, uh, a brick or something on the ground and you lever it up. The second one is a consolidated mechanism, something that moves. Um, so electrical generator is also a mechanism. Um, and it's interesting, back in 1942, he's talking about electricity, you know, we're, uh, in the, we, so electricity is still, like, there's no, there's no television yet, they're still in the age of, ra of radio. Um, so, uh, but talking about uh, mechanism and the way it changes is one way of seeing the world. Um, so the way uh, that we, um, the, the categories which we have for it, primary effective qualities, so there's a, a field of location, if you have a bar and a fulcrum, you can push it. Uh, primary qualities like the weight, primary laws. Um, then you have second ineffective categories. Um, for those of you who do software development, I think you would call these non-functional requirements. Um, they, they help you understand what makes up, as an example, this electric generator, um, but it may not be essential to it. Um, and one of the issues you get into is, um, and he actually writes later about uh, about how do you separate the primary qualities from the secondary qualities. There's a course, this, uh, the criteria of correspondence. Um, and so the, 
uh, the way in which you now think about something like a machine, you end up with an issue about the ideal machine and the reality of the machine. So before, when we're talking about formism, we're talking about a sheet of paper. It was kind of like, okay, now you understand there's a variant because it's an ideal eight and a half by 11. Uh, but in this case, you end up with, well, you know, can you describe the machine to me without having to go to the blueprints and look at the engineering diagrams? And so um, like no one really knows how their mobile phone really works. Uh, very few people would actually do that. And so, you know, we make up mechanism stories, but you push this button and that happens. Um, the, what happens philosophically though, is that there is a visual image or that usually comes along with that, that when you push the button, something happens um, that may or may not be really connected and how it works, but that's how we actually come to understand this. Uh, there's, it, there's also a mechanism where you end up with a verbal construction about facts. Um, and so uh, if you're actually assembling a machine, then you say, well, we put these parts together. And because we're talking about these parts that make sense to do that, then we put a machine together. But that may not be the reality of how the machine works. Um, if we start thinking about things like the human body as a machine, it's kind of like, well, you can describe it that way, but that may not be the reality. So a, a case of describing a, a bio, uh, something biological as a mechanism is like, that's pretty common. Um, and it may be helpful in some cases, it may not be helpful in others. The third world hypothesis he has is contextualism. Um, now, it was interesting in um, the order that he sequences these in the book, uh, because he writes about contextualism, and then the last one is actually organicism. Um, and so it's like, well, why is he doing this? Um, so contextualism is about a historic event, or the way that it's better described is an act in its context. So uh, the difference between this and uh, thinking about a machine, as an example, is that uh, the idea is that when you have a, a machine, you have an ideal, every time you assemble the machine, it would be the same sort of thing. This one says, no, every machine is different. And a machine from yesterday is not the same as a machine today. Uh, when we're actually working on, uh, on describing things, we should actually be describing verbs doing, enduring, enjoying, making a boat, running a race, laughing at a joke. And so um, the acts are all connect connected. Um, now in the system changes learning circle, the work that we've been doing and the research we have, um, the idea of texture and weaving comes out here. So we think about, uh, if you're gonna think about a thread or a line, it is a thread in time. Um, and you have historic events, um, you can have knots that cross with each other, but it's a different way of looking at the world because um, it's not causal. Like it's not like a machine where you can put things together and things will happen. Um, the, uh, the categories, you have a quality of the whole. Um, there is some um, um, spread of the quality of the event. And so it happens over a period of time. There could be a change in the quality. There's a, a degree of fusion, which is the quality of how things put together. So. Uh, like lemonade or a musical chord, uh, texture, things that make it up. And so now you're looking at strands um, and, and context and reference of the texture. And so this is actually the major contribution um, of, of contextualism. I'll come back. I'm going to go quickly through it and I'll come back through the four again. So the criterion, uh, when you, uh, so how do you know that something is uh, that uh, contextualism is true. How would you actually know that the act in context is well represented? Um, and it would be when something is blocked, because if you're talking about an event in time, now your idea is not so much about um, present and future, which it would be with the machine. It's that you are in the moment, uh, but something stops it in the moment. Um, and so uh, this is good for a good way of thinking about living systems. If you stop a living system and it's dead, um, then it's not a living system. So contextually, it's like, well, you kill them. So it's, you know, you have a system of equilibrium. Um, successful working and verified hypothesis are ways they prove it. So just let me cover off the fourth. Organicism, the root metaphor was organic development, uh, living, growing organic systems. Uh, change is given and stability is to be explained. Um, and so a lot of systems work is organicism. Um, because it, it is about holes and parts. 
and trying to explain how things change. And so uh, for those who've been in the systems while you might have heard the term homeostasis, and it's kind of like, well, how is it that you get a, a system, a living system that actually continues to live? Um, and it goes through um, progressive steps, uh, fragments of experience. Uh, but if we could talk about uh, how do you know it's really a true model, uh, it would actually be about parts in the whole, how things relate together. So um, how you assemble things together. Now you make a, a little bit of a leap here because when we talk about parts and holes, we kind of recognize those as common sense, but there's actually no way for you to actually get from the parts, the holes. And so um, we, we use Russ Acoff definition of the heart and the body. And you, if we give you all the organs in the body, you assemble them, well, you have all the organs, but you actually don't have life necessarily. So there's a progressive development that's required. Um, so Zad's about ready to throw some questions at me because now you're totally confused, but let me just review here. So <clears throat> four adequate hypotheses, formism, mechanism, contextualism, and organicism. Okay, Zad. Okay. So, so David, why amongst these four, uh, maybe a multi-part question, why is it that contextualism stands out as being particularly relevant to your research or our research and, and more broadly speaking. And you mentioned this idea of thinking in time. Maybe you can expand on that and its relation to contextualism. And the comparison question is, um, when you think about systems thinking, what are some of the dialogues that are going on that bring the organicist perspective into systems thinking and how, how are those um, conversations playing out? Okay, so on the first question of time, uh, formism and mechanism are really kind of time free. Um, they're kind of like ideal states. And so uh, the, the ultimate form, um, you go for ultimate beauty if you're going to aesthetics. Um, there, there is that approach that you would like to have. And the idea of timelessness comes out. Um, mechanisms, the idea behind a mechanism machine is that things should work the same again and again. <clears throat> when you come into contextualism, and into organicism, now time is central. Um, the reason that, <clears throat> that um, Pepper puts contextualism first when he's actually writing about it is that contextualism takes period, it's over a duration of time. But what happens, he says, in organicism is that the time disappears. When you talk about wholeness, then all of a sudden you've lost that idea of time because you have parts and holes. And you gotta go, okay, the parts make up the whole. We could talk about parts in time, but it doesn't quite make sense. And so this is actually where um, I think the, the systems thinking, like, and, th and this is what I learned right, writing about this is that system thinking, um, when, we, when people, like I've always said, you know, David Ng quote is, you know, system thinking is a perspective on heart, parts, holes, and their relations. Um, and so the idea of parts and holes is very much organicism uh, because you have organic development. But then what happens if, if it's not a part whole relationship and you have a whole whole relationship? Um, and this is where we get into, um, into the work that um, uh, Emery and Trist were doing and looking into Andres Angel's work. Um, and Andres Angel uh, talked about um, multiple holes and how they interact. Um, just to give another voice, uh, David Hawk, uh, could you actually give a little bit of background on Andres Angle? On who, David? Andres Angle and, uh, and uh, multiple oh. holes. Yes, yes, the, uh, uh, quite a number of the people I studied with were a fan of his. And so his work from uh, 1941, 42 uh, was quite popular with a collection of systems people. And when I began to look at it, I understood why. He asked, I guess he was a psychiatrist that became a social scientist that was quite interested in systems thinking in the early 40s. And so based on that, he put together a number of principles to think about when you're trying to deal with someone's psychosis or an organizational group and its psychosis. And so he, uh, he also was rather good because he talked about the end of an organization and the end of a system. 
And he was one of the first that actually talked about systems ending and becoming another system or something else. And so I, I quite liked him because of the dynamic character, of what he was saying. And for me, the most interesting question he ever uh, uh, raised is one that Churchman, Acuff, uh, Trist, et cetera, had trouble answering. They never could quite uh, deal with this question that was very fundamental to Angel, which was what happens when a system reaches its limits. They had never encountered the idea that a system would reach its limits, whatever the hell that is. And so he proposed in his work that uh, when a system reaches its limits, the parts assume the whole. And he said he means that in a positive and a negative sense. And so in essence, uh, uh, shall we say something like the Republican Party in America, when it reaches its limits, the parts assume the whole, and that's not a positive result. And Can so I interject? It's quite interesting for being uh, somewhat in another world of systems, but always a smile relative to questions he would raise. And so I, I, I quite like Angel. Uh, very few people know of him, mention him, reference him. Uh, he's really uh, out on the edge, which I, I think David well knows. But nonetheless, he emerges as very important in the footnotes of quite a number of important people. He caused them to think about things a bit differently. And uh, I, I cannot still understand the idea of a system reaching its limits, even though I know they do. And I'm sort of concerned that more people aren't concerned about that. Because so, uh, so, so, so let me let me go back a little change, bit. It will happen. So, so, so let me get down to the, the core of what he was writing about, because he was a psychologist. And so um, Angle, in effect, um, is with the one that brought the idea that there be there be, might be multiple holes inside a person. So you have multiple personalities. Yep. Um, yep. And so there's the, if you have multiple personalities, is there a hole over all the multiple personalities? And the answer is, well, no, there could be multiple holes. There are be multiple people there. And so when right. when I when I say um, a system is part holes and its relations, we always think about the part whole relations, but there are whole whole relations that get us into trouble. So, yes, so just, I'm going to cue you cue you in the shot in one second. But David, can you continue that thread and expand on what then is the value of thinking whole holes perspective? Well, uh, it, it, could I give David. a footnote to what I said, and then maybe that will help. And that will help introduce what David just said. Uh, one of his fans is a man called uh, Irving Goffman, if you know of him. Uh, many categorize him as the greatest social scientist of the 20th century. And, and I would probably agree with him. He was also one of my teachers at the same time I was studying with Trist, Akoff, et cetera. And Goffman was very good at talking about uh, Ango. He was a fan of Ango. So in essence, he put those multiple personalities into an interesting package to talk about when they would emerge and when they wouldn't. And that came out of one of his early conclusions, which a second footnote is he got admitted to a mental institution so he could study them. They would not allow him to go in the door and study patients. So he got admitted and this was as a student. And so he studied mentality from within a mental institution. And in essence, he uh, came out arguing that the most unstable people are the doctors that are managing the mental institution. The patients actually are quite interesting and we can learn a lot from them. And so he talked about the patients in essence being a whole, David, that he in essence would package them as a whole with these alternative thought processes depending on who they talked to, what question was asked, how they felt, whether the sun was up. So in essence, he put each character into a hole and made his life simple doing that. So, so just to, um, to, to reify that a bit, so that would be a hole in context. 
Yes. And so every person he's talking to is a different context. And so it's a different whole. Exactly. So when we start talking about world hypotheses then the, the idea that someone would actually have a, uh, a hypothesis where we could actually have one world, which would be an organ, organ assistant, organ, organicism view yep. is kind of yep. like, well, okay. If you're saying that I get that idea, but if you, if you don't believe in the one world hypothesis, then it's like, oh, you need something else. You need contextualism. Yep. 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 Nishad, did you want to jump in here? Or did you want us to continue further and see if is there a natural spot where you want to jump in? No, no, go ahead. I was just asking if it was Engel who um, who made that, you know, uh, distinction of the parts becoming the whole. No, I think others made it before him, but he okay. uh, he went deeper into it on what the hell does it mean in psychology. So he was one of the people that got Trist out of psychology into social psychology. Okay. So, David Ng, um, were you continuing with the wiki or did you want to have a natural break here to invite further questions? What, what were you? Uh, maybe we have a natural break here because um, the, the, the foundations, uh, okay, let me do one, one more. I'm gonna uh, do one, it's a two by two. David Hawk hates two by twos, but um, so I find the, it helpful. The uh, questions are starting to roll in. So maybe it makes sense if you wanna do this one last matrix and then we'll, yeah. and we'll go to the questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, okay, so the four adequate hypotheses. Okay, so th this is the two by two. Uh, dispersive theories, integrative theories, analytic theories, synthetic theories. Um, and, and so um, while there have been more world hypotheses put on, I actually like this two by two um, because um, an an analysis is taking things apart. Uh, synthesis is putting things together. Uh, dispersive, I don't think I have dispersive. No, I didn't write this up yet. Um, so dis disper dispersive would be um, from, from um, parts outward, integrative, putting it back together. So there, there's some, they're, they're dispersive is over time, integrative is not over time. Um, so you end up with these four categories. And so um, there is a two by two matrix. And what, the, what I was looking at and what I've been trying to figure out is the research we've been doing within System Changes Learning Circle, is it actually another uh, another world hypothesis outside? And it's kind of like, well, I actually like these four. And so I'm gonna make the subtype type here, but I think the, world, the work that, um, that comes from uh, Urban Laszlo is actually organicism. Um, and so uh, for those of you who know Alexander Laszlo, who is the son, he carries on a lot of this work and they, they think things together and they do think about one world together. And I tend to not think that way. Right. So um, I think Elena's comment applies to something earlier, so we can come back to that. But Robert asked the question, are holes in some, con are holes in some context better represented as parts? Uh so if, if, it is a, if, if it's a part, then by definition, there's a hole somewhere. Um, actually, Doug McDavid once said pieces. You can go to an auto junkyard and get pieces of a car uh, from which you can get parts. Um, but a piece would be not necessarily a part of a hole. Uh, a part generally connotes a hole. Right. I don't know, Robert, if feel free to jump on or if you're in the non-speaking mode, that's, that's, that's all right. But um, uh, Kelly, why don't... Why don't we get some of the interaction on screen as well, Kelly? You, you had a question next. I think I was just trying to understand what David Hawk was saying about uh, about uh, the Trist question. The Trist question of of what happens when holes uh, reach its limits, and so so just using that, that that as a reference in terms of if the hole was industrialization and it's reached its limits, does it mean that it that it comes into something new, like the uh, like a new word. I, I happen oh. to use market economy, but I, but I'm not quite sure that that's. Yeah, I, I, I increasingly relate to what you just asked. Not that I know what it means, 
but relative to climate change, we're going to see many systems reaching their limits. And then we're going to get to answer your question of what happens when that system reaches its limits. And essentially all areas of science that address that point out it's not a nice time. So the systems we rely on that define us, that define life, the divine industrialization, economy, et cetera. Those are all approaching their limits vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And so in essence, we're gonna to get to see if angle makes any sense in terms of the parts assuming the whole and moving on into another category or self-destructing or losing their mind. And he indeed mentioned that losing your mind could well be an aspect of the part assuming the whole which the system had lost its mind yeah and so it went so i like very much this concept relative to understanding climate change and what will happen thereafter other people i think maybe find it sort of beside the point and confusing and you know you'll be dead anyway who cares etc cetera, etc cetera. but i i like it very much relative to my concern with climate change Thank you. Um, we both we have comment from both Gary Metcalf and then Peter Jones, and both of them reference Tavistock in some. They're weaving. They're both weaving and asking some threads or connections. So why don't Gary and then follow it, followed by Peter? You can share your comments. Yeah. Thanks, and it was really just to follow up to the the influence of. Um, of van der Sangiel on a lot of folks in Tavistock. So he he was a big influence really before they knew anything about vertical amplitude and open systems. Um, but there were other people, I mean, understanding there's a whole thread, there's a long thread of uh, psychoanalytic people in Tavistock that came up into other kinds of work. And so people like R.D. Lang, when David Hawke's reference to, you know, the kind of re redefining this concept of what's crazy, you know, Lang was one of those people who articulated that really clearly. So it, it's a curious question for me about, you know, what happens at the end of a system when it reaches its limits or begins to dissolve in some way. <clears throat> I, I think one of the things you see is things that are considered abnormal reactions to a given situation all of a sudden become more understandable and normal when the system itself collapses and begins to fall apart. Mm -hmm. That helps. And Peter Jones, you happen to mention the similar thing about Lang and the connections with Basin, double binds, uh, and contextualism. If there's any well, uh, just in the conversation, the chat, I thought that I might relate it back to the deep contextualism of 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 Lang's approach to um, each patient being their own, being in their own world, being their own whole within the family. But already, but as as, you know, as, as Gary would know from from Artie Lang's, you know, position as an anti psychiatrist is working very intimately with patients, um, you know, at, in and of their own worlds, which he wrote about in Politics of Experience. His um, use of the double bind theory, which he considered to be somewhat universal, as um, what's what's called schizophrenogenic, or that it would actually the, uh, a double bind relationship within the family system created the the created um uh, you know created a, a, a such problematic conflicts within the psyche of the developing child that they created at least two personalities to contend with the, the conflicting messages that they were getting in the double bind messaging from the parents and Lang's theory he would essentially test this by bringing the whole family in, or at least the parents with the child, with, with the um, child, so, so that they could observe that they became a system that made sense when they were all together. So the double bind and the kind of statements that would be told between the child having one relationship with the mother and a different conflicting relationship with the father would be resolved in a whole system as the family. So he wrote, um, a number of books on this, including um, um, The Politics of the Family, which followed politics of experience um, are around these dynamics that, so he did systematize it 
that has tried to make a, a universal in a sense, which wasn't accepted by psychologists, but it made uh, a lot. It made sense to the kind of you know radical hippie psychologists of the time, which you know kind of influenced me. Um, and, and David Cooper and Lang also used as their therapy a kind of really deep, deep approach to creating a radical context of love for their for the therapy. That is, they just found and they that this was very. <laughs> this is also something very much in tune with the '60s and '70s, I think. Um, but and I don't know how that's continued. Just just as a point, so there are two inadequate world hypotheses. Uh, one is skepticism, and the other is dogmatism. And uh, Pepper actually puts um, love into the dogmatism um, because <laughs> so the, the skepticism says that there is no truth. And then the dogmatic says there is only truth. Um, and so um, those are the other, he, he starts off with the skepticism and then goes to dogmatism and then goes through the, uh, the other four. Just, just to go back up, I know, Elena, your comment came much earlier when we were talking about Pepper, but on the subject of weaving some historical threads, did you want to share that comment? And then we can go to uh, Lowell, Lowell Christy uh, after that. maybe or yeah we can we can uh come back why don't we go to Lowell, lowell's question and then uh, he has his hand up uh bateson was very fascinated by context and content because there is the communication crux between the the ability to understand and assimilate and make meaning and the what you see and perceive and the problem is when you get into a paradox or a metaphoric situation and go one of two ways it can become cancerous is what david hawk said the part becomes the whole my liver is cancerous it it cuts down the morbidity gene within itself and says i am the whole and literally puts out things so it's that blood will go to the liver. The other one is fascinating because that's what Bateson was really focused on is learning and how do you transform. And I use the example of two uh, hydrogen atoms in a tinder uh, world of, of uh, matchmaking with an oxygen. And when you start putting those as separate entities, they have certain properties. They have ultimate degrees of freedom. But once constrained and by linking up, they produce something totally new. And so the ability to be trapped within the field of the context and content, and if you control the context, that's tyranny. <laughs> if you're able to then transform, you're able to create something new that has never been used or developed before. And that's what I see with like the founders of democracy. That's what they tried to get is that let's put together all these people and come up with something new. Otherwise it'll collapse, but it has to have that tension of the multi parts and the union. So on that, that raises an interesting point. Thank you all. Like David Ng, is there an element in Pepper's work of learning being integrated into these hypotheses? So one of the interesting things, having done a search, full text search, the whole book does not use the word learning. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't appear in the whole book. Um, but um, the uh, so I, I saw that Peter uh, uh, Peter Scott had put in Limits to Growth Club of Rome um, in, and so the Limits to Growth I think is actually an organicist um, approach, um, and the idea that that we could actually work together as a human race to do something, that is a whole. Um, and so if you are not approaching that, um, and uh, I don't know if United Nations is better or worse than that, that you have different different constituents in negotiating, how is it you'd manage something like David Hawkins said, like climate change? We're not gonna get, um, we're not gonna get a uniform answer to it. There's gonna be a lot of going back and forth between multiple holes, between nations trying to represent their people and then within the nations you've also got 
lot of factions are going against each other and parties and stuff like that going on. Mm -hmm. So, okay, well, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll continue with some of the questions, but I'll, I'm curious to come back to that learning aspect of it, but maybe, maybe afterwards, why don't we go to Donald and then we'll go to Robert's follow-up. Uh, Okay, well, um, <clears throat> not having had a chance to rehearse this, I hope I will still be coherent. Um, I've been, I'm taking my clues right now from the reading I've been doing lately. Uh, an interesting book called The Chaos Machine, which is an extremely good reporting on just how we got to where we are in the world of um, social media. And it's, well, really bad. <laughs> it's not a pretty picture at all. It's going to be very hard to fix. Very, very hard to fix because of a lot of factors in our society. And this is a worldwide phenomenon too. And it's a very dangerous and very deadly one. It's caused a lot of problems. So that bothered me a bit because, uh, you know, we introduced these new tools uh, with a very optimistic notion that people would learn to, to get to know each other and work together but they actually use them uh, as shields, you know, to hide behind anonymity and throw stones at each other. And uh, that was kind of a horribly regressive thing. But they have a lot of help from the algorithms and so forth. So that and the whole notion of AI is problematic. Now, how, why, where does that relate to today's discussion? It go, in the sense that I think we're looking at some fairly serious attempts to be very precise very accurate in, in definitions here by a number of the people that we've been discussing, some of whom I've heard of, some of whom I have to say I haven't because I just haven't gone that way. Um, I, I think we need to get beyond that somehow. Um, another thing I was reading is that there was a study just released, I think, uh, where is it now? One of the Northern American universities, I'm sorry, I can't remember which one, that Innovation in all the sciences across the board has dropped to an extremely low level. It hasn't uh, even looked at for 50, 60 years. What you're getting is a lot of refinement and, and um, accommodation of one you know, aspect to another. People aren't taking chances. They're not using their imagination. They're being very, very careful. And of course, there are real world factors that play into that too. Right, the availability of jobs, the ideology that we find in and off and on campus and in society in general. These are a lot of complex issues. And they don't just apply to the world of academics or the world of trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> they apply to the actual function, which is much, becoming a lot harder. We're swimming in tar now, it seems like a lot of the time. And uh, we, we still haven't come to grips with the pandemic, or as somebody said, the infodemic that goes with it, which has been pretty disastrous. Um, clearly, we could. We've got the capacity, but we don't have the inclination. And uh, I think a lot of these processes are not nearly as fixed or as um, defined. They are interacting with each other. They are changing on the run. When we talk about how many personalities does a person have, they say, well, is this before or after breakfast? You know, it, it, it's much more fluid than we would like to think. Or maybe we should think that way. Maybe it would help. But I think we're going to have to come to a point where we make a lot of changes in our way we approach all of these things. We have to do a lot more conversations, a lot more thinking, a lot more comparing different vocabularies, which uh, may seem at cross purposes, but might be much more coherent. Anyway, that's enough. That's just where I'm coming from. <laughs> let, let me take that on with, with uh, um, social media and, and technology. Yes. Uh, and, and so thinking about um, the, for, the world hypotheses, um, the, uh, a lot of technology is related to the mechanism view, which has cause and yeah. effect. Yeah. If you go to the contextualist view, you don't have cause and effect. Exactly. And so it's like, well, you know, will people accept that? Uh, I won't say going all the way to random. Um, no, no, because, no, 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 no. Right, right. 
but but what happens is that in 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 the contextual world we have threads that um, overlap with each other and they tug at each other in a fabric sort of thing. That's right. Uh, but that's complicated. Um, that, that's 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 takes a um, it takes a lot more. And I and part of the reason I've been looking into um, Chinese philosophy of science. Yes. Uh, it, it's because it's just like okay, we're we're so based on Western philosophy. Uh, and a lot of that has come up through uh, mechanism and formism. Mm -hmm. um, so or organicism and uh, contextualism are kind of new to that. Yeah. Um, but but the thing that um, that uh, comes out of Pepper is that you can't mix metaphors. Um, and, that, that's, <laughs> and, and when you go through and they start breaking down. Um, so the 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 part that I've made a bridge to is actually uh, West Churchman's design of inquiring systems because he has four inquiring systems and actually one of the articles maps um, the four inquiring systems to them. And then he has the fifth, which is a uh, Singarian inquiring system, which you kind of go around all four. Um, and so you, you would have to think of, yeah. think of a problem yeah. in four different ways. You can't mix the metaphors, but you can think of it four different ways and try to learn. And so mm -hmm. that's responding back to uh, Zad's question about learning is I think that, um, it, it's helpful to think about things like, you know, what's the form, what, what's this like in form? Um, what's it like in, if we actually had causality with like a machine? Uh, what, what will it be like if we just let it grow like an organism? Um, or we get into the contextualist, which is how does it get tied up in knots with everything else in the world? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so, there's a couple of things to add to that that maybe helps, maybe, certainly helps me. Is it, I'm also reading, I guess it's Tim Palmer's new book, um, The Primacy of Doubt. This guy is a meteorologist and a physicist and a philosopher of science, <laughs> all of the above. And he's saying that many of these laws we assume are immutable are actually shifting. They're moving along. They have their own dynamics. And um, this, is, this is why complexity is such and chaos are such, so, so problematic because you, you can't deal with that sort of thing, even though you can see it happening. And the other thing, just going to mention, I read a, a wonderful article on quantum computing, <laughs> which apparently can deal with a lot more of these non-causal relationships if you can only get them to work. <laughs> yeah. So, so David, I'm going to, David Ng, I'm going to jump in here about a follow-up question on these latest things that Donald shared and you're responding to some of the Michael Jackson stuff as well is, and this is a loaded question in terms of the the terms used, but what are the what are the challenges or the the difficulties with seeing socio technical systems in a context through a contextual worldview? Why is that such a a challenge to to come to that perspective? Okay, so the socio technical systems perspective and the socio psychological. And I, I actually had to go back and look at the work that uh, is around all the work with Emory. In effect, they're both organicist. So if you're working with a company, um, then it's like, as a consultant, you actually want the company as a whole. There is a whole. Um, now, if you are, but if you're working in a ecology or a marketplace, then it's like, well, there is no whole. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're going to, to uh, Alibaba or eBay and you're going, oh, there's a hole there. It's like, well, is there really a hole? Um, so maybe we should think about Shopify since it's really, you know, is, is there a whole at Shopify or should they just like pare down and, and stop trying to lead and just, well, we'll be the marketplace. Well, you know, we'll help people in the marketplace, but there's no Shopify per se because our, the, the vendors who are on Shopify are the ones that make the difference. Yeah, I, I'm curious to get to bring Dr. Peter Jones in on that from a systemic design perspective. Does the contextualist worldview resonate with some of the methods that you've been Kind of exploring in the last few years with that community well i i think the distinction david just made was was also useful when you look at um how to characterize a system in, in a design context where you have to get agreement from people that may be working in a network or in a system change context and so a, a, a system change oriented network that might start from a small group is of course highly contextual. It's going to be formative and, and not have a good sense of, 
of what their whole even could be. If it's successful, it will emerge as a social ecology um, and there will be frustration um, it, between those that really want to have uh, a, a defined um, a defined approach towards change that would be, you know, that they would use the tools for to construct a really intentional approach to a theory of change or using a three horizons or a multi-level perspective. And they may not even ever really realize that they're going to be working within a fuzzy network, a constantly expanding ecology that they can't contain. And if they're successful, they don't want to contain it. Um, there's a, and I think, and this is something that we haven't dealt with very well, I think in terms of methodology, but I think it comes up a lot in systemic design is that conflict then between the, the, you know, the, the approach to designing interventions for, for del deliberate, deliberated change in, in an intentional idealized direction and, and, the, and the fact that the change in, in, in those, in, in, in social change or in a lot of NGO contexts are, is very you know, poorly defined in terms of the boundaries and, mm -hmm. it, and it may need to be. And so their, their approach to change is going to be, you know, take perhaps a long period of time and have to be very interconnected with other contextual projects. Mm -hmm. I, I say this half jokingly, Peter, maybe there's, if this Pepper's work is built on a theory of knowledge of doubt, maybe there's a doubtful design. <laughs> maybe there's benefits to... Uh, <laughs> reincorporating doubt in the design uh, and building off yeah. that. Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, Robert has a follow-up, but I'm just going to read Genesis' question, Robert, if that's okay, and then we can come back um, to yours. But Genesis was just sharing that they're thinking about Ashby's law of requisite variety and the question of parts assuming the whole. Does the parts assume the whole negatively when the system loses its capacity to correct or manage varieties? Um, so I, so I would place that under an organ or organicist view. Um, and so, uh, just referring to what Peter said, if there's a network, do, does the idea of requisite variety even make sense? If you're talking about a network as opposed to talking about uh, a whole, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that is a good question. I mean, there's requisite variety with respect to the often of a, a form a formative team, but if it's going to grow into a network by intent, the, the thing is that that's going to be a, a system change process. It can be it can it, it can be a pseudo democracy. You know, if it's really a network, it can be it, it can use memes or other modes of kind of viral transmission that are uncontrollable from you know whatever the core team or this there can be a social system in the middle of, of a network like this there often is um, and they may have a concept of the requisite variety that they that they expected to you know that they expect to develop um even the network or a larger expanding social system around uh, but it can you know, what happens when it you know when that blows up i think we see that a oh, lot these days, <laughs> going back to the social media uh, issues that, that Don was talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So just um, giving the follow up to uh, Robert here. Um, so his question was, is, is there always a greater whole where these holes in a relation look more like parts in the context of that greater whole? Is that what this idea of whole longs is getting at? Uh, partially, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go concrete. And since um, Ward is on and Robert are here with Federated Wiki, people are having a lot of issues with uh, the move from Twitter to Mastodon. Um, Federated Wiki is kind of of that ilk, which is, you know, okay, so is there a whole Federated Wiki? And it's kind of like, well, no, there's no real whole. People have duplicates of pages that they like and they create them in the collection. Is that a whole? Is that like, it's not like Wikipedia where there's like in one kind of standard truth of the world that everyone refers to. It depends then on, you know, whose wiki you're on in the Federation. Um, so um, one of the uh, things I'm going to try out for, and, and this is, um, so, so Zad is trying to convene a, a, a explainers group. Uh, I'll try a little explainer um, a sound bite. 
which is when we're thinking about holes, I think that we think about what and why, but when we think about contextualism, we think about when and where. And so we're talking about truth. Um, you know, is, is it true? And, and so the way that you normally would work with, uh, with an organicist or a, 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 me a, a mechanism is you would try to figure out the ontology and the epistemology, the, you know, what is it uh, that's an ontology and, you know, how would you know which is epistemology? <laughs> But when I look over into contextualism, it's much more like, uh, okay, well, we have this um, action that would work in this context, but we're actually not sure if that's the right context or not, because uh, it's a wicked problem. It's not repetitive. We can't actually do it again. Um, so we can try, we can try to position for that, but the when and the where overrules um, a lot of what, uh, what we're thinking about. Um, in, in the idea, of, uh, uh, since I go to a Chinese doctor, it's, it's interesting that the Chinese doctor would always say, you know, I'm going to give you some herbs, come back in a week, they may work, they may not work. Uh, and people kind of go, oh, that's not good science. And you go, well, have you ever heard of personalized medicine? Uh, personalized medicine would be contextual that says that, oh, this, this medicine doesn't work for everyone. So how would we create a science where people actually get different, um, different medicines? And that would be contextualist. This maybe slightly bridges to Peter's question, Peter Scott, that is, uh, his questions about sense making strikes me as a mechanism, as a useful learning mechanism. So, referring to the question we talked about earlier about learning, Peter, feel free to jump in if you want to share your, your understanding of sense making, or David Ng, this connects to maybe the inquiring systems and, and, and some of the learning um, context that you shared as well. Peter? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um... Uh, geez, I, I kind of want to just step back for a bit here and just, just, just to say, I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of this conversation, um, because the people in the room on the chat is just, I'm, I'm just so outstanding that I'm just, I'm so, I'm just really, ad, I, I'm really admiring the breath that you bring to the conversation and, um, and I actually don't really have anything I want to say other than just to, to say I'm I'm really honored to be in the conversation. I, I've known Peter Jones and David for a while, and and it's just um, it's it's a it's it's I think it's it's um, yeah. And I'm just really pleased that I'm a part of this community because I think that that this idea of thinking together and and um, thinking out loud together and and sometimes even just sitting with the idea is is very very important and and sitting with it we don't always have to know the answer to everything we but but sitting with the idea can teach us something uh something of purpose something of truth and and so this idea of dare i say spiritual that can be understood at a deeper level and 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 uh, we don't always have to know if that makes sense we, but we can feel and sense but we but we don't always have to define and write it down if that makes sense so i just wanted to just put that two cents in and to say that that systems can be methodologicals as well and they can be experienced as well but they don't necessarily have to be defined so, so let me respond a little bit to that on the idea of sense making um, and the the question of sense making uh, after having read Pepper is there's, there's actually two ideas that come. Firstly, uh, one is um, is how do people see the world? Um, so um, you probably like I am, and you've you've met doctors, and you go, oh, that's a really insightful way in which to see the world, which is not not necessarily medical, but the way they see the world of holes and parts and things that fit together very well. Um, that's very much an organicist type view. Um, but the other question that comes not just of, with the world hypothesis, it's kind of like, what world? Uh, because I, I th I, I, I've come to understand that, um, that the way that they, they express the world is, is interesting. Um, 
Pepper actually created uh, in uh, this, there's uh, a lead through to another book, Concept and Quality, that's published, I think, 1972. It's, it's very much later. And he's like 75 years old when he actually publishes it. Um, and he looks at uh, a world of purpose. Um, and uh, I'm not a fan of it. But I can see, uh, and you could have the argument of whether it's an adequate world hypothesis, using his language, whether it's adequate or inadequate. But if you have a, perp a person only sees the, the world as purpose, and then you cross them with a doctor who comes from an organicist point of view, and they kind of go, yeah, you know, you might want to be six feet tall, but you're not going to make it. Yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing that uh, appreciation, uh, Peter. Um, Peter, Peter Scott, that is, and appreciating the, the context that, that we have here on Systems Thinking Ontario. Um, uh, there's Some, another time, could I mess things up a little bit? Sure, David. Things are beginning to make too much sense. Uh, and by messing things up, I, I, in essence, mean going over the edge into the world of physics and what physics people do and where the art of physics is at this moment. And in essence, uh, you know, some leading physicists have now gone into the world of uh, cosmos as holographic, but in essence, the entire universe is a hologram. And I find that interesting because back in the 70s, I took a course from the Dean of Engineering at University of Pennsylvania, who had developed a friendship with H.T. H. Odom. And Odom had uh, somehow convinced him of a new way to look at physics vis-a-vis -vis what Odom had been working on. So in response, he offered a course on holography because he thought that was an obvious response to what Odom had been working on. And so Odom gave some lectures in the course. Uh, the Dean of Engineering gave some lectures on the importance of holography and why it, in essence, may explain the universe better than many other things. And taking that to what David has raised, in essence, he argued that in a holography, everything is context. If there are parts, they're irrelevant. Just forget about the parts. In a hologram, it is all context. And so stay there. And so there was this course given that was probably one of the best courses I ever took, which at the end of it, H.T. Uh, Odom commented uh, to the Dean of Engineering, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and they both laughed for a while. And that was a plus for both of them. And so in essence, David wins if in essence the argument, the cosmos is holography. And one little footnote on that, which probably will upset everybody uh, I'm also a fan of, uh, of uh, Stephen Hawking, and I rather like his approach to many things. And he has argued that uh, in the cosmos, uh, humans are a chemical slime. And in essence, the good things humans do every now and then have to do with funny relationships between certain chemicals in that slime. So every now and then a combination pops up with something helpful to understand what they're doing and what's going on. But in essence, he argued with some enthusiasm that we are a chemical slime as a holistic phenomena. And in essence, the parts are various chemicals. And he argued uh, in essence for diversity in terms of chemistry and hoping the parts come together and somehow help something do something. And so I sort of like that as a backdrop whenever I get a bit proud of what humans are doing and have done, I always trip back to Hawking and his uh, say, well, and then of course other people have gone into Hawking to say that is a black hole, a hole with a W, an H or what is it? So how do you relate the idea of a black hole to holistic thinking to a hole and if indeed can anything escape from that hole if indeed it has entered that hole or the same relative to aspects of systems thinking 
that in essence, what can you take out? And so in regard to that, I wrote this paper a few years ago that some conference in uh, England wanted, and then they wanted to publish it. And then these people in Ukraine wanted to publish a book around it, which had to do with socio-technical natural. So in essence, how to give a larger context to the socio-technical dilemmas, which was nature. And again, relative to climate change, how to put the two within a natural context to see if those two in essence can be subservient to something else and not worry about which is subservient to the other. And in essence, this also relates a bit to the Hawking thesis coming out of, again, physics. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is extremely confusing <laughs> to people that have begun to understand what the hell's going on in the world. But if you look at the cutting edge of physics, you'll find they really relish getting beyond the understanding of what's going on because they think the cosmos is a very different phenomena. And as I've mentioned before, particularly to David, I had this nice relationship to Carl Sagan where he and I put on a symposium at a conference together. And he was really fascinated with my concept of negotiated order and how negotiated order was a way of understanding the universe. And then David helped write this very nice paper on how to move from uh, uh, hierarchy and bits and pieces to networks. And the network theory paper that David helped put together, I, I think has been very helpful to quite a number of people. And so each of these very confusing, what, tangents, David, has actually been quite illuminating in a number of ways. There, are you confused now? I, I think I am. <laughs> you, you, you've reminded me that uh, um, one of the news headlines for this week was that IBM has been, I think, for 29 years, the leaders in patents, and they've decided that they're no longer going to pursue patents as a goal. Um, and that comes right. to open, open sourcing. And so it's like yep. that IBM may be giving up on the organism or, or organicist view and going with the contextualist view. Hmm. Yep. Th this relates to my friends at Shenhua, which are considered the leading computer scientists in the world in five of the eight categories of computer science. And they very much are into open source. And for them, the enemy, not really enemy, but the sort of... Uh, Black hole is Microsoft. And so whatever they work on and teach is to make fun of Microsoft and what it does and how indeed to develop an entire approach to computer science that's based on open source and open ideas and would uh, use Microsoft software for humor, but not for actually doing something. And so they look at IBM as sort of an ideal company that, that that uh, they praise ideal a great deal because of what you just said. And your thesis is quite popular, just not in the Western world with Microsoft. <laughs> well, I, so. I, I can explain it now as contextualist. Zad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to, maybe it's funny that we, David Hawk mentions your thesis and we usually wrap up uh, at the 20, at the 20 minute, right? So in a few minutes, so it was maybe more of a summary type of thing, David. I know you were sharing this session to walk through the Pepper's work, but I want to maybe come back to why you, David Ng, if you're interested in answering it from that perspective, are interested in contextualism and what are you seeing, in what ways are you seeing when you see the world through a contextualist point of view in your own context, in what ways does this help shift your thinking and where, where do you see this work potentially going? You mentioned briefly about being a subsect of contextualism. Yeah, um, so reading Pepper, um, and understanding contextualism and the way he described it, uh, I find Pepper was too limited. He doesn't actually make contextualism uh, well understood. Uh, for people who ha are fans of YouTube, you might go look at Tim Ingold's work because Tim Ingold uses the idea of lines and threads that are much contextualist and they explain it better. Um, I find that uh, uh, it's compatible with Bateson, it's compatible with JJ Gibson, um, and it, it's just that the ideas have moved on. Um, but the, 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 the key idea of moving to thinking about when and where 
um, has, has become really important to the way that I'm seeing the world. It's so there, there's no such thing as good or bad or right or wrong or, you know, good strategy, bad strategy. It's like, no, it's like, it's all timing. Um, you know, why, why fight? Why fight forces when you can't? Uh, just wait until um, the time is clear and then move forward on that. I think that's a wonder, wonderful summary of it's all it's all timing, and so therefore that connects to the when and where. Um, I don't know if how are we doing on timing. <laughs> Speaking of timing, <laughs> I know there's a couple of exchanges in the chat. We can continue if people want to hang on, or do we do we want to wrap up here uh, over to David or Dan on logistics? Uh, we're fine to go on for a few more. There, as long as there's people interested in chatting, we can continue because. If people have other places to go, they can. Right. Yeah. Why don't I, I, I have give... to go. <laughs> okay. See you, Tom. Why okay. don't I give um, Chuck Norris, you wrote a question earlier that we didn't get a chance to get to when we were talking about VSM. Uh, sorry, uh, requisite variety. Um, maybe you want to, if you're available to jump on video or audio, you can share that or I can read it. Yes. Sorry about the old and squeaky toy in the background. Um, I, I, the requisite variety and the change that I saw in reading some of the VSA work. Um, my my first response to the VSA work was, where where have years requisite variety gone? It seemed to have been diluted in the VSA approach. But I think the the question before from um, Genesis about requisite variety just set off a light bulb in my head, thinking. Well, actually, it doesn't probably matter when you come out from the sig single organismic view um, of BEARS VSA and you put multiple VSAs together under a, um, a wider governance framework, the requisite variety in that, um, that larger community is probably less material. So I've had this kind of flipping of, of thinking between I originally thought VSA had diluted requisite variety, um, moving from VSA, sorry, VSM to VSA. I just wonder whether I'm completely off base. That would probably be my question. Maybe David, um, when you think about holes and variety and what you were trying to lay down, am I, am I drawing too far a, a bow here? Um. No, so I, I think that you've come down to one of the basic things that happens with actually within this group, and we've been had over a hundred meetings. We end up with back to the the question of what essentially you understand as systems, um, in plural, uh, and and what is the system of interest that you're talking about. Um, the the contextualist view brings in the idea of of time. Um, and uh, we, we, we uh, the research that we've been doing in system changes learning circle has actually been talking about rhythmic shifts. And so the root metaphor that we will be using is rhythmic shifts, not just rhythm, not just time. Um, and that's why it is clarification. Um, but then the question as to when you're actually working on a project or trying to uh, represent uh, a system to someone, how you represent it, uh, there, there is the question as to how the other person understands it and whether you can convert them. So um, one of the things that having read Pepper and, and, and thought about this now is the systems community is very organicist. Um, and, and coming down through Von Berlanti and having the biological view, that is a view and it's very dominant and it has the idea of a whole, but that's only one of the ways you could see the world. Um, so you know, fun fundament fundamentally agree, and I think uh, Jackson's uh, five lenses, as he he's tried to move from critical systems thinking to critical systems practice, and his his four his four CSP papers over the last three years, and the pragmatist lens around the five metaphor lenses certainly has helped me to in, an, in a heavy engineering environment to get away from the mechanistic view or get away from the organismic view and actually think about um, some of the other lenses. Yeah, no, no, I agree. And thanks, David. That resonates. Why don't we get um, Elena actually in? Uh, Elena, I don't know if you have any thoughts or 
contributions to share from from that perspective or overall? Uh, well, I was um, I was just trying to answer in the um, in the chat uh, that the basically between the observer and the observed um, in at least second order cybernetics, it's really kind of arbitrary which you design as which. Um, the uh, the purpose that someone might be saying um, would be uh, to reach a certain goal, then the the entity that expressed purpose, I would think, would be would be the controller. But sometimes it's just a um, an equilibrium rage. I think it's only in simple systems or engineering systems that you have a real um, clear delineation between the controller and the control. I think, I think uh, in addition to that, Ward, Ward had some comments as well, or if you wanted to share share thoughts on that topic or others. It just occurred to me as I was listening that that uh, it's easy to imagine more structure in the system than is really there if you can see it in its totality. And living systems are notorious for this. Engineered systems less so because you have a team that does one part and you have a different team that does the other part and they naturally separate. So, so a lot of control theory comes from engineering. And, uh, you know, if, if we use engineering as a model for our human systems, then, you know, a lot of engineering principles apply, but they don't have to. I guess I was thinking about the internet and how it turned out to be a lot different than the engineers thought it would be. Right, right. Um, Peter Scott, see your, your hands up. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to um, uh, to just uh, maybe chime in and now that I've sort of collect my thoughts a little bit more, I, I wanted to to pick up on the word that Elena mentioned, purpose and the idea of control and so on. And, and then maybe just bring back the conversation to what I had mentioned before around sense-making. And, and, and also that, you know, the, I, I, and I, you know, this is a wonderful thing about conversations like this. We can talk in a respectful manner and, and disagree with each other. Uh, and, and so I wanted, I kind of want to disagree with David a little bit. <laughs> you talked about the four areas of um, that that Pepper, and maybe not so much David, but maybe Pepper said that they're not they're not um, related. I think, believe it was, or they're not uh, supposed to be used to. Um, they're supposed to stay compartmentalized, for lack of a better word. And I and I wanted to just put the notion out that that it seems like the they could be complementary. Um, so I'd love to hear David's point on that, this idea of organ organisms and context. They're intentionally there to help us make sense of things, make sense of the world. And, and, and the moment we start to do that, they are working together. And they strike me as complementary like that, David. And I wondered, I just wondered what your thoughts are on looking at them as a collective, to as a way of sense making. Because as I think, as human beings, we're constantly trying to make sense of things, make sense of the world, and our purpose, our sense of purpose. And so, I wonder what your thoughts are on that, David. Um, okay, so there's multiple thoughts that come with that. Um, one is that I'm going to relate forward, and and one of the links is about. Um, uh, Stephen Pepper and uh, Thomas Kuhn, 
Uh, so Thomas Kuhn came up for tenure um, at Harvard and didn't receive it. And so Pepper actually invited him to come to, um, to Berkeley. And that's when he wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And so the idea of, of that, and this is standard reading for every PhD student, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions is that um, there is a change in the worldview uh, and um, I, I use a colloquialism that at that point, science changes and you have to burn all the old textbooks because they're wrong. <laughs> um, that, that's actually been challenged, uh, but that would be a very hard view consistent with um, Pepper. And some, some, there's actually one um, researcher that I've, I've cited somewhere in the wiki that says that in effect, um, uh, that uh, Thomas Kuhn stole the ideas from Pepper. Um, but there's also a view, and, and this is uh, Ji Zhang Zhu's um, article in, in Systems Research and Behavioral Science, where uh, he talks about later Kuhn, where you have branches. And so, uh, so it, it's not such a revolution that people are black and white, that you, you, know, you burn the old textbooks, but you work and, you, and you, the way you advance science is through the exchange of knowledge incrementally, much more like an organic process. Um, so, um, I, mo most of the struggle in, uh, in, um, Pepper's writing is because he was writing against logical positivism and now I have to do a little philosophy. Um, mm. the, he, he has this idea and it's, it's one of the things that showed up, which is how do you corroborate? And so the corroborations are two. One is man with man, and the other is corroborating data with data. Mm. Um, and, and so he says, okay, so we wanna find out how tall someone actually is. How do you do that? Well, you send 10 men out and they all measure the height of the person, they come back and they report. And then, okay, from that, we'll figure out what the truth is about the height of this person. Um, but there's other ways of finding truth. Uh, he talks about a chair. So um, will this chair bear the weight uh, we'll have 10 men sit in the chair, and if it breaks, then it doesn't break, then it's strong. But the other way would be data with data, which is, okay, we look at the chair, we look at, it was manufactured by someone that's been around for 100 years, they wouldn't go bankrupt if they uh, made chairs that broke. Uh, you could do engineering tests on the chair, um, but that's not the same sort of thing. And so a lot of the world hypothesis and what he actually uh, differentiates, the man with man is what he calls data and then the uh the um data with data he calls danda uh, there's a lot of the world that is wrapped up in danda um like so you know how do we know the world is round how many people have actually seen the world is round it's like well very few people have seen the world is round so there's a lot of stuff that is brought up um in putting that together so um those structures and the way that uh, that the thinking is put together is not just a metaphor, it's a whole world hypothesis. Um, getting really close to the research between system changes learning circle. Um, in year one, um, I was doing a lot of reading about a traditional uh, classical Chinese medicine. And um, uh, Dan and Zad and uh, Kelly said, you can't actually present that because you'll get rejected by people. Like they, people, don't, people just don't believe in, in Chinese medicine. And it's not a different philosophy of science. And so can you argue that? And it's kind of like, well, it's a world hypothesis. That's the way I put it now. People see the world in that sense. Uh, other people see it in a different sense. Um, you may not be able to bridge them, um, but Keacock Lee, the, the author that, uh, that put me on the right path says, you can't judge cats in a dog show and you can't judge dogs in a cat show. So, so Peter, for mixing metaphors, the dogs and cats are getting mixed up. So just speaking of when and where, I have to step away for a bit. I'm going to leave my Zoom on, but Dan and David, I'll tag, tag you both in for moderate. I would keep going because Lowell, Lowell has an, a great question. So feel free to keep going. I'm just going to step away. Okay. Dan, would you like to moderate? Oh, Dan may have stepped away. Um, Peter, did I, did I respond? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, you gave me lots to think about, and uh, I think um, I, I think you know the, the 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 four the four structures, the four categories that that you talked about, 
is, is they strike me again as a useful way of making sense of things. And inherently as human beings, we are always trying to make sense of things and we will never stop doing that. And so these structures are socially constructed ideas that helps us to make sense of things. And, and the moment we let go of that, you know, we're in another dimension. We're completely in another dimension. And I think that can be applicable to a lot of this broader organisms, broader whole system or holes, if you will, that, that we just don't have any understanding of. And we would perhaps never have an understanding of, but, but we can have a sense that they exist and appreciate them that they exist at a deeper purpose level or the deeper uh, force of the universe level, physics and so on. But, but we, we may never, never have the tentacles to really, to really kind of like, I think that the, the point, one of the points that, um, let me see, I think it's David that says um, Hawkins idea that human beings are just, um, what was the quote is a wonderful quote. Chemical slime. Chemical, <laughs> chemical slime. Chemical slime. Chemical slime. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting quote, but it makes it a point because it, it makes us think about perspectives and 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 I think that that's the useful thing about us thinking about things and 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 sitting with it and to be able to and then even the story you mentioned, David, about Chinese medicine and, and sort of um, this idea of curing in context, curing uh, based on individual specific needs, you know, and I mean, those are phenomenons that the West is not yet ready to embrace. And so there's usually a cloud over what is that, <laughs> you, know? you know, and these are some of the challenges that we have in our world today. And it's okay to sit with that and to be not necessarily know all the answers is my point. Yeah, yeah I, I think that um, as I've been reading more pragmatism and trying to understand what pragmatism is, the idea of common sense really is, um, well, firstly, it has a word sense that you've been using in sense making. Um, but uh, we, all, we all have to make decisions and get on with our lives. And that's where the common sense pragmatism kind of takes hold. It's like, even if you don't know and you have doubts, you still have to move forward. Exactly. So Lowell, I know you put a comment in the chat about invisible dynamics of power. Did you want to talk about that? or What's interesting is Samuel Huntington in his Clash of Civilizations thesis <clears throat> basically said the only way you can deal with the Clash of Civilizations is have wars. Uh, the alternative is actually what we're trying to do here, which is looking at the epistemological construction. And that can be a fascinating philosophical endeavor. But let's take it to reality, which is over time, those patterns play out. And we do not have a science that looks at the consequences of pattern, like a natural history of a T-Rex and its development over time in re relation to its ecology. We are ecological creating entities like beavers that uh, David had in one of his presentations. And we need to be thinking about how we design that world around us and its consequences. It's called truth and consequences. And I really see that's the way that the American Revolution was based upon people who read history, where you insert time differently. And we're all children of the enlightenment. The question is which enlightenment? The continental enlightenment dealt with rationality, physics, and those first two areas of the world hypothesis. The people coming out of the Scottish Enlightenment looked at time development, and that was based upon understanding the human body as a regulatory system, not as a hydraulic system or of pneumatics, et cetera. So our ideas have consequence. The question is, what's the consequences of the pattern we create? And I'd love for Ann Gibbon or someone like that from the design world to comment on that. Well, from the design world, we have any designers left? <laughs> May not. It's eight thirty-four, uh, David. Do you want to continue to go, or what? 
Um, no, I think we should probably wrap up. Um, uh, Lowell had, had had a message about um, about power, um, and so the discussion I've been having with Gary Metcalf has actually been about um, uh, about uh, Burrell and Morgan's framework, um, which is so the Burrell and Morgan's um, sociological paradigms uh, is is a way of looking at the world. Um, but I'm actually falling off that now more because um, if I look at Pepper, Pepper is looking at the world, whereas I see that Burrell and Morgan are focused on the social systems. Um, but we may bridge to that next month. Um, so uh, with that, Dan, I think we're done for today. Okay. Thank you, people. Fun. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.